Today will be a day to remember for the rest of your life. The Pro Football Hall of Fame is excited to present the heart of a Hall of Famer program connected by Extreme Networks. With over 100 Hall of Famers participating, we have reached 47 states and countries all over the world sharing the message that football is more than a game and can teach Americans important life values like commitment, integrity, courage, respect, and excellence. But you have to make right decisions even when nobody's watching you. Well, respect is not just given out. It's not handed out like a, like a, like a brochure. It's earned. Today, you are presented with an opportunity to meet and learn from one of the greatest football players of all time. But more important than that, the chance to see that their Hall of Fame life wasn't given to them. They didn't roll out the bed great. They put the work in, on the field, in the weight room, in the classroom, in their communities. They made themselves a Hall of Famer on and off the field. Your feet can't take you where your mind's never been. Because you can make it, but it's just going to take a little hard work and some effort and the drive and determination. And today, you will learn you can do the same thing they did. You don't have to have a gold jacket or a bronze bus to make a difference in the lives of others. It's your decision whether you want to be a successful student, son, daughter, brother or sister if attitudes are contagious is your attitude worth catching it's integrity as well because when you decide to pursue something and you don't quit that says a lot about you commitment to excellence we can all aspire to be the best welcome to a once in a lifetime program the heart of a hall of famer program connected by extreme networks When I grew up in Norway, my dream was to become an outstanding ski jumper. But I never dreamed that my greatest jump of all would be to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. 19 seasons in the greatest team sport ever invented produced a lot of memories. The excitement of a Chiefs Raiders contest, the thrill of a Monday night football game, uh, autumn Sunday afternoon at Lambeau Field, and of course the satisfaction of a job well done. Let me close by going back to where it started, ski jumping. When you get off that ramp and you fly through the air, for a moment you feel as if you have conquered a world, as you are soaring high above the ground. Today, with these memories and this honor, I got that same feeling, the feeling that my feet are now touching the ground. Thank you, American football, for giving me this truly unbelievable moment. Thank you. All right. With that, I'd like to welcome everybody to another edition of the Pro Football Hall of Fame's Heart of a Hall of Famer series connected by our great partners at Extreme Networks. My name is Jake Ray. I'm the Youth and Education Manager here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I'm coming to you live from Canton, Ohio, one of the best museums out there, the Pro Football Hall of Fame for our special program today featuring the great Hall of Famer, Mr. Jan Stenrud. And we'll get to him here in a second. Uh, as I said, my name is Jake Ray. I'm going to be moderating the session today, taking questions from all the different students we have literally from all over the country tuning in today. Our mission here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame is to honor the heroes of the game, to preserve its history, to promote its values, and to celebrate excellence together. And those values we promote are those of commitment, integrity, courage, respect, and honesty. Those are five values that they're going to make you a pretty good athlete. They're going to make you a great football player and truly made Jan Stenerud a Hall of Famer. But more importantly, those values make you a great person. Values you can use off the field, in your everyday lives, the classroom, at your homes, in your community to make you a great person or like we like to say, live a Hall of Fame life outside of the game of football. So I'm excited today and hopefully all of our students are as well to hear how these values impacted Mr. Senarud's life, both in the game of football and outside the game, and how they truly made him the man he is today. Now, before we get started, I do have some thank yous I'd like to pass out. First and foremost, Extreme Networks, our great partner on this program. Thank you so much for providing us the opportunity to share this program with students 
all over the country and for everything you do for schools, colleges, universities, all over the country, all over the world, uh, and allowing them to be able to connect into this program as well. So Extreme Networks, thank you so much. Secondly, I'd like to thank our teachers, administrators, uh, professors, educators, anybody that shared this program out today, people we're connected in with today. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of the program and allowing us to be just a small part of your students' learning experience. And then lastly, got to thank our students. You know, without you guys here today, this, this program doesn't take place. So thank you so much for tuning in today. We have a great group of schools are going to get the once in a lifetime chance to ask the questions directly to a Hall of Famer. And we're going to be going through them throughout the program today. You're going to hear from them. You're going to hear from me. Got some great questions from our museum as well. You'll hear, hear all that today. We also got some great schools on, uh, watching this as a view only school. If you've got a question, submit that in the chat function. We'll go through those and see if we can make those part of the program as well. And then lastly, we are live on Facebook. If you're tuning in on Facebook right now, watching this live, submit your questions. I got the stream pulled up here right beside me, and we're going to do our best to see if we can get some questions from our Facebook Live audience as well. Uh, so without further ado, truly one of the great players and great men of the game of football. Please join me and welcome Pro Football Hall of Famer, Mr. Jan Stenerud. Jan, welcome to uh, the Heart of a Hall of Famer program. Uh, uh... Jake, first of all, am I unmuted? I don't, I can't yep, see. Yep, we hear you. We hear you fine. So everything is all set. Yep, we're good. We're good. <laughs> we're ready to roll. To no, I'm really looking forward to this hour. This is going to be a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, let's start out simply. You know, I, those five values I talked about, commitment, integrity, courage, respect, and honesty. Out of those five, is there one that stands out to you as most important or do all five kind of work together to make you the best person that you can be? I cannot think of one that you can omit. I think all of them are very important. And you're going to need it many times in your life. Uh, sometimes things are not easy, and you got to stay true to your course and do the very best you can. Now, when you look at back at your football career, obviously you learned so much about the game of football, what it takes to become a great kicker, what it takes to become a great teammate. But how did the game of football teach you values like that or, or overall life lessons that you were able to apply to your life outside of the game? Well, first of all, I think American football, of course, I come from another part of the world. I came from <clears throat> Norway to ski in the United States and ended up kicking field goals my senior year in school. But American football, I think, is the greatest team sport ever invented because on every single play, all 11 people have to do exactly what they're supposed to do. There are a lot of other sports that one person can don't, don't need his teammates and still have a successful play. In football, everybody has to do their job to the very best they can. So it teaches you uh, to get along with people, to work hard with people. And if you love the people you play with, you go the extra mile to do even more than you would with your own uh, tenacity. So um, I think I think it just uh, I've been so fortunate to be part of teams. That, now, ski jumping was an indiv individual sport. But when you win and you can celebrate and you can you can uh, and also accept defeat, whatever your life brings you. You can do that with the team. There's nothing like it. Now, I, I'm hoping some of our students did some research today, but you mentioned your, your story is a little unique on how you got uh, into the Hall of Fame, and, you know, playing the game of American football. So can you kind of give a little bit of background on, you know, where you grew up, what you were planning to come to school to do, and how you ended up eventually playing the game of football? Well, there's no question that when I uh, it's taken, it was an unusual route that I took to get to Canton. I was born in Norway, I grew up, uh, of course, Norway, most of the students know. Scandinavia is Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. And skiing was the main sport, uh, but I was always fascinated by America. I had an uncle and aunt that immigrated to Buffalo, New York from Norway 100 years ago, 1921. They would come back oh, about every fifth year, told me about the skyscrapers in New York, the big cars, all the great things that was going on in America. So when I'm 19 years old, I'm a very promising ski jumper in a country where ski jumping is about the main sport. All of a sudden, one day I got, got a letter, invitation from this coach at Montana State University, asked me if I want to come and accept the full scholarship in Bozeman, Montana. It did not take me long to make up my mind. Uh, my father was all for it. School in those days, uh, even high school, cost a little bit of money. Uh, it's changed a little bit. Even college is free in, in Norway now. But 
My mother was a little bit hesitant. She thought maybe I would meet an American girl and never come back. That was her <laughs> little bit of, that was her portion of the discussion I remember. But, so my plan was to go to the United States for one year. If I liked it, I stay. And then I came to the unique life that you have in colleges in the United States. I didn't know what a campus was. I heard that word, welcome to Montana State Campus. When you go to school in most of the European universities, you go to a classroom, but you don't have the, you don't have the campus life. You don't have the basketball games. You don't have the football games. You don't go to the student union building and mingle with other people your age. It is the unique experience and I love every minute of it. And then of course my plan, of course who I skied against, a lot, of, a lot of them are Americans, of course, but also other Norwegian young men that I had grown up with in Norway. And they were at the University of Denver or Colorado or Dartmouth or Utah, University of Washington, the list goes on and on. Uh, but part of my workout for the football season or for the ski season was to keep my, keep my legs in good shape. And I ran the stadium steps almost every day, my freshman year, my sophomore year, my junior year at Montana State. And one day the kicker on the football team was down to kicking field goals. And I played a lot of soccer. That was my summer sport. And I thought, gosh, I have a little bit of an urge to kick a ball. It's been three years. So I kicked with a toe like most kickers. Now, the young people that are in the audience tonight, they probably don't remember that field goal people kicked with a square toe. And it was a toe punch kind of. It wasn't the soccer style technique. So I asked them after a few attempts, can I kick with the side of my foot? Like you take your corner kick in soccer. And he said, yes, there is a guy for the Buffalo Bills. His name is Pete Gogolak. He kicked to the side of his foot. So I did that a few times. And I noticed I hit the ball much further than the, the, the kicker on the team. And the word got back to the football coach. There was a Norwegian skier out there that they had, should take a look at. Uh, so before my, our last home game, my junior year, 1964, I was running the stadium steps again. The football team was working out in the stadium. And all of, I didn't pay any attention to them. But all of a sudden, I heard this booming voice. Hey, skier, get down here on the field. I hear you can kick. You didn't know my name, of course. So, so that was the first time I kicked the ball off a tee. He wanted me to kick off with a little break in practice for the team. And they were kind of maybe laughing and said, what's this skinny kicker going to do on the football team? And on the first kick, I'd never had a ball on the tee before. I kicked from the 40-yard line like a kickoff. The goalposts were on the goal line. It was 70 yards to the goalpost. I took about a seven, eight yard start and I topped it a little bit. The ball dribbled like a squib kick and the football players started laughing a little bit. But coach Jim Sweeney, he said, try that again. And I tried it again and he went all the way through the goalpost into the seat, 70 yards away. And he said, can you do that again? I said, I think so. So I did that three or four more times. The, the football players started cheering. And right then the coach put his hand around my, my neck and he said, uh, my shoulder, and he said, young man, what's your name? He says, what are you doing tomorrow? Well, I knew what he meant. It was a football game tomorrow. So I thought, wow, if you are in America, the land of opportunity, if the right opportunity in ours, who knows what can happen? That was the beginning. I was not eligible for that game because I was on the ski team. I was not on eligible football yet. But I was, he wanted me to kick in the pregame warm-up. Now, the full stadium at Montana State seated 8,000 people. I had ski jumped in front of 80,000 in Holm Holman Cone, that's a famous ski jump in Oslo. So I wasn't too concerned about the crowd, but that was the beginning. I went out for spring practice and made the team. That was a very long answer, Jake, but that's what happened. <laughs> awesome. No, I think it gives a full background because, you know, you look at the careers and, you know, everybody thinks, you know, everybody obviously goes through uh, their own journey and, and it's unique in its own way, but yours, it's just super, super unique. And, you know, you look back at the, the history of your position, specifically in the game of football, and you look at another Hall of Famer, Morton Anderson, kind of a similar journey to yours. Grew up, you know, outside the United States, came to the U.S. for college, for, for, for high school, ended up staying, becoming a kicker and a fellow Hall of Famer. So watching his career kind of blossom and grow, did you feel connected to him in any oh, special absolutely. way? Yeah it, was a, yeah, it was a little bit different because, after I had done this, when Morton came around about oh, 15 years after me, by that time, if they had an exchange student, for example, to a high school, they would, they would say, did you play? Because now they've seen people like me or the Google Axe, the premium, kicking soccer style on television. They would probably say, why don't you go out to the high school team? That's what Morton did in Michigan. Uh, but in my case, 
it wasn't like that. It just happened. So I was one of the first two or three to do this. It wasn't like I was asked to go up because other people had been kicking. They came from South America or from Europe. Mine was just a very good fortune, I guess, because it wasn't, there wasn't anybody that told me to do this because I seen other people doing it in high school. So it was a little bit different, but Morton, I became a great fan of Morton Anderson. And as a matter of fact, the first time I saw him kick in a game, I think it was a rookie year in 81. That was my 15th year or so. When I saw him kick off, I thought to myself, hmm, this guy can kick the ball as far as I can. I'm glad he's not in our training camp to compete <laughs> against me. So I have followed him for a long time and they're very good friends. Awesome. All right. We're going to go out to our schools now for our, for our questions. Schools, what we're going to do is we're going to state, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and unmute your microphone. All of our students asking questions today. State your name, your grade. And then go ahead and ask your question. So first off, we're going to start with Winskill Elementary School, Ms. Buzzin's class. So uh, Ms. Buzzin, go ahead and have uh, your microphone unmuted there and have your student state his name. And then go ahead and ask your question. I can see him ready, sitting there ready. Oh, have her ask her question. Oh, now the camera's moving. Have him ask his question. Go ahead. Go ahead. And what? When you were playing football, did you have um, a role model in the league? Awesome, Jan. So the question is, did you have a role model when you played in the NFL or somebody you looked up to when you were playing the game? Well, a role model a lot of times, I guess, means people in your position. Um, and I didn't have anybody but was because I would just nobody had been around. I only seen the other two people or three people that kicked field goals. I never saw them live kicking the football. We didn't have ESPN television. We didn't have NFL Network. There's only a few games televised. So I never saw them actually kick until I competed against them in a game a couple of years later. So I didn't have a role model from a from a fellow kicker that I wanted to be like. But I, I love sports. I think sports is so good in so many ways. So, so my, my heroes growing up were actually ski jumpers and speed skaters. So I didn't really have a role model, but I, but I always enjoyed athletes that were very good, but I also thought it was so neat if they did the right thing outside of the sport. And then you could learn from them, admire them for what they did besides what they were doing on the field. I think that's a super important part. Kind of speaks on what we talked about earlier, how the game of football can be used to teach you game, teach you the X's and O's, but teach you also all those awesome uh, life lessons. All right, we're going to go out to another school now. We're going to go out to Harvey Elementary School, our friends out there in Santa Ana, California. They were up early with you this morning, Mr. Santa Rude, uh, for our next question. So, uh, Harvey, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Hi, my name is Terry from California. Was it hard for you to come from Norway and go to school in the United States? What were some things that were new to you? So hey, can, you, look, can you help me with that question? Yep, looking back on your career, you know, kind of talked about your journey. What was maybe the hardest thing for you to adjust when you came from Norway to the United States? Why well, are you talking about as a student or? Yeah, let's, a, you know, we're, we're talking to a bunch of students today. So as a student, what was the hardest adjustment for well, you? Well, it's no question that the language barrier would have to be because I sat in class and you wanted to take notes and do a good job. And of course you had to have to be on that to keep your scholarship. Uh, you had to be good enough in schools that passing grades so you could, otherwise you wouldn't be able to compete in sports. And I would sit in class and I did not, a lot of times I didn't understand what the teacher said. So to combat that, I took math, chemistry and physics the first year and just one English course because I want to make sure that I could, because I took a lesson, history lesson or some other uh, social studies, I wouldn't, it would take me, it would take me all night to read a couple of pages. So that was the hardest part for me. But I, uh, but I got through the first year because I could have, I could memorize chemistry, physics and math. Uh, so it was hard work the first year and I, and I missed uh, home, but also, uh, living in Montana State, and I want to remember the most, the Americans were so friendly. They always, you walk down the street, that was used to, you wouldn't say hello to anybody unless you knew them. You walk on the campus and people never seen before, they said, hi, how you doing? How's it going today? And I thought it was so neat. I liked the, 
the way uh, uh, as friendly and as Americans, how easy they were to get along with. Awesome. Very cool. I, again, it talks to you about your entire journey and how, you know, sometimes it doesn't have to be, you know, moving to a new country. It could be trying to take a new class or start something new. You kind of have to adjust and, and reposition yourself in order to succeed, just like you did, Mr. Stanarud. Um, you know, I talked about at the beginning, you know, we here at the Hall of Fame, our mission, uh, and the two first pieces of that is to honor the heroes of the game and to preserve its history. At the core of what we do here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame, we are a museum and we're preserving the history and legacy of all the great people who have played the game, not only Hall of Famers, but anybody who had a stop in the NFL. So we thought, what better way to showcase not only to you, Mr. Stanarud, but to all of our students, all of our audience today, and give them a behind the scenes look into our archives here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our VP, Vice President of Archives, Education, and Football Information, Mr. John Kendall, with a little behind the scenes look into what we do here at the Hall of Fame. Thanks, Jake, and thank you, Jan, for all that you've done for the game and all you do for the Hall of Fame and our education programs. And uh, welcome to the Ralph Wilson Jr. Pro Football Research and Preservation Center. So this is an area at the core of our mission to honor the heroes of the game, preserve its history, promote its values, celebrate excellence together. Uh, when we talk about that mission um, down here in the archives, we're honoring the heroes of the game and and obviously the 354 individuals who have a bronze bust in Canton, but every player, coach, and contributor who built the game to what it is today uh, through their, uh, like we're, we're sharing their legacies through their artifacts, their documents, uh, and, and their stories. And we're able to showcase the values that the game teaches through those stories and hopefully showcase that the same values that made you great on the football field, John, are the same values that make somebody a great student or a great teacher a great business leader. Those things transcend the football field, uh, but we learn so much from the game. And so back here, we have over 40 million pages of documents, 6 million photographic images related to each one of those players and coaches and contributors, as well as the, the game uh, as a whole. So we have over 55,000 game programs in our collection. This is probably one of our more rare and unique. This is Princeton versus Yale the first ever college football game played on Thanksgiving Day, uh, 1880. So pretty remarkable there. We've got pretty much every book ever written on pro football history. A lot of them as they relate to the early origins of the game. We've got game programs uh, related to college all-star game versus um, the NFL champions, which was the Chicago Tribune charity football game. It uh, lasted from 1934 to 1976. And like I said, something you'll never see again today, too much at stake for all parties involved, but that pitted the college all-stars of a given season versus the NFL champions. We've got uh, press materials. This is a uh, Green Bay Packers uh, media guide from the 1937 season. A lot of people talk about last week's uh, Kansas City Buffalo game as maybe the greatest game ever played. Uh, that uh, title actually belongs to the 1958 NFL championship game uh, up to this point. And uh, that's a game program from that game. Um, draft cards. We've got the draft cards from every player drafted into the National Football League uh, since 1997. So what better way to start a player's personal archive then with the draft card of, of where it starts. And that's probably our most famous one there, the sixth round pick 199 overall, Tom Brady. And then a few things over here related to your, your career, Jan. This is uh, your kicking shoe from the 1969 season. Uh, that was for the, uh, at the time, the record for most consecutive field goals made. And that was uh, 16 field goals made. Uh, we've got some things uh, unique to the Kansas City Chiefs here. A letter from Lamar Hunt to uh, William or Bill Sullivan Jr., who uh, awarding a uh, franchise in the American Football League to the Boston Patriots. Uh, and then you played for, for Hank Stram, and uh, uh, he was your presenter obviously when you were enshrined. And this is a letter that we have from his collection. And I love it. This is from 1960. And this was when uh, the Kansas City Chiefs were actually known as the Dallas Texans and, and played in Dallas. And he was sending these letters to players, recruiting them, you know, uh, after the draft or as free agents to come to training camp. And his last paragraph says, our Dallas situation is rather unique and that the National Football League placed the team here in an effort to destroy us and the American in football league it is imperative that we get off on the right foot each team in the league will play a 14 game league schedule 
and the winner of each division will play for the championship. Plan on playing 15 games, man. So he obviously had that championship mindset. Uh, and, and we also have here some of your photo collection, Jan, uh, as well. But one of the questions that, that I had for, for you is, one, I guess, uh, what was it like playing for Coach Stram? And, and you know, was he a, a mentor to you? And, and maybe why did you select him as your presenter? Uh, and then secondly, uh, playing professional football is just tough. And I would say from a mental aspect, playing kicker in uh, professional football is probably the toughest thing to do. And so how important was confidence to what you did and, and how were you able to maintain that confidence over such a long period of time? Well, go back to Hank Stram first. Uh, actually, uh, he has seen me kick one time live. Montana State played the University of Tulsa in Tulsa in 1966. And Hank flew down from Kansas City to watch that game. And of course, he watched me mainly in pregame warm-up. And he liked what he saw. Now, when I came to Kansas City, I actually had been drafted by, I didn't say how I finished my college career, but I only kicked. I was drafted by Kansas City after 13 attempts. But see, my senior year was the first year on the football team. Then I stayed in school one more full quarter after the ski thing has ended because this, the coach says, if you stay one more quarter in school, you can also get drafted by the NFL, which happened. So I had a choice between the Atlanta Falcons that were brand new in the NFL, and then, of course, the Chiefs AFL. Uh, but Hank, when I, when I finally signed with Kansas City, I met Lamar Hunt. I met Bobby Beathard. He was a scout for us. Lamar Hunt is, of course, the owner of the team. Hank Stram, head talent scout, guy called Tommy O'Boyle. I liked them so much, but it was no question that in 1966, the AFL was not quite on parity with the NFL. I know the young students do not know much about this, but then when I finally came to Kansas City and Hank, before training camp, he would actually come to the practice field. He only had one practice field. And he would come down before uh, in the off season before training camp started and actually came out the field and held the ball for me on three or four occasions. He held it from the right hash mark or the hash marks were out wider. So he wanted to know what was my real strength, what was the weaknesses. And he wanted to learn about the kicking so he could help me coach. So that was one thing that you don't see too often that a head coach now comes out in the offseason and hold the ball on the field for a potential kicker. I don't think that's ever happened before. But he always, uh, he, he knew that I did the best I could. I had to learn on my own. There was nobody that could teach me. There was not, nobody I could watch. Uh, but he almost gave me the confidence. He just said, you can do it. You're the best. You're going to be one of the greatest kickers in the history of football. I kept hearing this. I kept reading about it. And I said, well, that's. Uh, that's kind of unrealistic. We don't know that. But he gave me so much confidence. So much confidence. Now, the other question was about there's no... The, the position kicking field goals in the NFL. Uh, I enjoyed it as a young man. You, you're 22 or 23, four years old. You play on championship teams. You become a, you know, kind of a celebrity in the town that you're living in. and you, It's a big deal. Football is the biggest game. So... It's quite an experience for a young man to, to do that. Uh, but also, I didn't play the game. I maybe made 20 tackles in 19 years. And the, the, the position kicking field goals is nothing but pressure. It, every time you step on the field, you put points on the scoreboard. And if you have a good game in close games, you're going to make a difference in the game. And then, of course, if you don't make it, you're in real trouble because not only are you letting the team down, but you also can lose your livelihood. I always felt that I was only two games, two bad games in a row, I'd be in the unemployment line. And to, to explain that a little bit further, uh, and then again, how do, you, how do you control it? Well, actually, I believe that the background as ski jumping was actually a good background because when you stand on top of a big ski jump and it's your turn, you better concentrate. You better give it all the attention you can. Uh, but it was difficult. And also when you stand on the sideline and think you missed the kick, and say, if I miss one more, I may lose the job. I'm not going to get paid next anymore. And, and I, in addition to letting the team down. So how do you control the pressure? I learned early on that I was slow down in the game compared to practice. Things happen faster. And plus, you're a little bit nervous. So, so things, you react a little quicker than what you should. So I learned to, to do that. Other than that, 
I also knew that I would be a little bit nervous on the sideline, but once the coach says field goal team, I never heard anything. I didn't hear any sound. I was, I was just concentrating. I was able to do that. And that's what the, if you're going to last in pro football a long time, you, you have to have that ability. It's not easy, but I was able to do that. And I'm sure the best, all the guys now that you see, if they kick year after year, they wouldn't last if they didn't have that ability. Because one thing is to be great on Thursday, but you also keep, you've got to carry that over when it really counts. But there was no exercise. There were no, there were no, uh, you know, sports psychiatrists or psychologists in those days. They were just telling yourself, God darn it, I got to make this kick. I got to make it. There's no, that's all there's to it. There was nobody that came you over and gave you a positive reinforcement regardless of how you failed right before. There was just a matter of doing it on your own. There was nobody I could talk to. Well, thank you so much. And like I said, appreciate all that you've done for the game, all you do for the Hall of Fame. And I'll send it back to you, Jake. Awesome. Thanks, John. And I'm going to send it right back out to our schools. We're going to stay right here in Northeast Ohio. We're going to send it to the I Promise School. And if you don't want the I Promise School, is very, very cool. Started with LeBron James and his family foundation opened right here in Northeast Ohio in Akron, Ohio. So we're going to throw it out to our students there at I Promise for our next question. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Um, my name is Sean. Uh, I'm in fourth grade. What was your favorite game and why? Favorite game and why? Well, it has to be. I was fortunate or I only played in one Super Bowl and that was uh, John that was a long time ago that was in after the 1969 season so that game was in January 11th in 1970 and it was the last game to be played between the two AFL team which is not called the AFC teams and the NFL teams and we played a very strong team the Minnesota Vikings they were favored to win by 13 to 14 points the whole week and I was just telling myself all the day before the game, I said, we got to win this game. I don't care if I do personally, as long as we win the game. And we got off to a good start. I kicked three field goals early in the game. We led, led 9 nothing right before halftime. And we won the game. And that was, that has to be, because even at that time, there were 70 million people watching the game on television. Now, nowadays, I talked as well, over 100 million people watching the game. But the population in the United States was about 225, 225 million. Now it's about 345 million. So, so percentage-wise, it was just as many watching the game on television then that it is to now. Now, uh, the, the, a lot of things were different, though. Uh, the ticket prices were, I think it was $15 a piece to go to that game, Super Bowl IV. Super Bowl One was 7 or $8. Now... You have tickets that cost uh, many, many thousand, many, many thousand, up to ten thousand dollars just to go to the game. So, a lot of things have changed, but Super Bowl had become very big by that time already. At least by Super Bowl three, the Packers won the first two. The, the first one is the only one that wasn't packed. There was only about sixty-five thousand people in the LA Coliseum in Super Bowl one, and that's the hundred thousand people. But from then on, every game was totally packed. And of course, Super Bowl three, maybe one of the most famous ever when the AFL and Joe Namath, the great quarterback for the Jets, he promised the world that he guaranteed that he was going to beat the Colts the next day. So, so being in the Super Bowl, that is the goal. And to, but the important thing is, it sure, it sure feels good to win the Super Bowl. I'm sure you're hoping that your Kansas City Chiefs are just made it one step closer after the game this weekend. So I'm sure you're pulling for them. Um, our next question, we're going to come from another school right here in Ohio, Maple Heights, uh, ECAC with Mr. Green out up there. So go ahead whenever you're ready. Have your students step up to the microphone, unmute, as, and students, state your name, your grade, and then go ahead and ask your question. Uh, can, you get, can you get a little bit closer to the mic for us? Hey, my name is Tyrell here, Maple Heights, East Ohio. Um, my question is, what are the most what are some examples you had to persevere in adversity? So what were some examples, Mr. Senaru, uh, where you had to persevere through some adversity? I'm sure moving countries and starting a sport you never played before, I'm sure there was a lot you had to get through. Yeah, it was, but it was a very pleasant experience. There were also two other Norwegian guys on the ski team when I got there. And also, when you, you have an advantage when you get there to be on the team because we had 12, 
13 people and a coach for the ski team. So all of a sudden you're in one group that you make friends with right away. So that was very helpful. If I come all alone as an exchange student, it would have been more difficult. Uh, so it was, that made it a lot easier. And, but I also enjoyed what America had to give. We, uh, heck, I bought a car after the first year in college. I never even had a car, I even thought about buying the car where I came from. Uh, we had television set, it was modern. The United States was uh, truly the land of opportunity, the most modern country on earth. And it was a very pleasant experience. Yeah, did I miss my, my, my parents and my friends and family? Of course. Matter of fact, I did not even call on the telephone home in four years. We wrote letters back and forth. The first time I was on the telephone with my parents uh, was after four and a half years, when I was four years and one quarter, when I signed with the Kansas City Chiefs. It cost money to call back in those days. <laughs> But later, my parents came and sold several games in the United States. So, so going to, uh, you know, and also in addition to the people on the on the ski team, you also around all, all the people your age, and they have the same goal as to be, you know, become go through school in four years and and study and 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 build the good foundation for the future. So for me, it was uh, I did not struggle at all. Yes, I miss part of my family and, and, of course, Norway, but it was a fairly easy transition for me. For what, because the life I was living, it was, it was really fun and it, it, was, it was very pleasant. Very cool, very cool. All right, we're going to go to our next school. Now, I had to write this down, so I made sure I pronounced it right. We're going to go to Sevastopol uh, School up there, I believe, in Wisconsin. So you're uh, home of your, your other team, the Green Bay Packers, for our next question. So our students there. It's a vastable. Go ahead and step up to the microphone, unmute yourself, and then go ahead and ask your question. All right, I'm Logan. I'm a junior or I'm in 11th grade. And my question for you is, what advice do you have for young athletes who want to serve their team as leaders? Do what? Who wants to what? Who want to serve, that, serve their team as a leader. Yeah, that's, that's so important. And usually, a leader, I think the positive attitude is one thing that is very important. The leader also have to be, I think it has to be smart. He's got to understand the whole situation and understand why people think the way they do because you're gonna have people coming from different backgrounds and have different feelings. So I think a leader typically uh, over the years that I was, it was one of the older guys on the team that had experience. He also most of the time uh, it doesn't have to be a star on the team, but it seemed like most of the time, uh, really well-known or good players, a good player seems to get a little bit more attention than a player that is hanging on. So that, but there are, a lot of, there are a lot of different ways to lead, but I think, I think uh, you have to be smart and you have to have a really positive, great team attitude, particularly the team sport. The team is what matters, not what you do. Now, if you do a good job, we all do a good job, the team is going to benefit. So it's pretty easy to also knowing that, that you have to think about your own performance, obviously. But team, 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 it's, it's, the, it's the main thing. And my team leaders were great players. They were very smart. And uh, I think they spent time. It, well, they made it look easy sometimes. They would come up with things. And I thought to myself, boy, that's, that's, I wish I had thought of things like that. So I think it, to be a team leader, it takes a lot of work too, because you have to prepare. The guy doesn't stand up in a locker room or in, in practice and say things unless it looks like it comes very natural to them, but I'm sure they pay a lot of time, spending time and preparing for these moments. Absolutely. I, I think that's a great way to talk about it. You know, being a leader is one thing, but then coming up with new ideas and you know, passing that leadership on to those younger players and those younger people on the team is also just as important. I got another school we're going to go out to here. This is Mayfair Elementary School up near Cleveland, Ohio. So, uh, Miss Burleson, there, go ahead and unmute your microphone. Have the student uh, ask their question. Ask question. My name is Delilah, and I'm in fourth grade. And I wanted to know: Do you have to know about angles? and measurement to be a kicker? <laughs> well, that's, that's a that's awesome a, question. That's a great question. Uh, yes, you do. And I went through some of that evolution. When you see kickers now, you see that line up, that mark, put their foot on the ground, 
They look up to the goalpost, they go back a certain distance, and then they go sideways a certain distance. You see them step off. So angles, that is, and you experiment a little bit too, because you're not exactly sure what the best angle is. You may change a little bit. Now, when I started out early on, I didn't take those steps, and I wish I had. I was just kind of put my foot on the ground, marked the spot, and then I kind of back back up approximately three yards and, and to ever what angle that looked pretty comfortable. But to do it exactly right, they have, it becomes such a science. It's almost like a golfer when they prepare for the golf, uh, golf shot. They take a lot of time to get it set up exactly right. And the best kickers, they do that now when you have to. So angles and doing things exactly the same thing over and over again, it, it requires to be very accurate in the things that you just mentioned. I never had that question before. I think that was excellent. Awesome. Very good question. And you talk about the kickers today. And one of the questions I, I wanted to ask is you know, when you see a guy like Matt Prater or Justin Tucker breaking record after record, as we know Justin Tucker broke the longest field goal ever kicked in NFL history this year uh, when he kicked it against the Detroit Lions. How cool is it as a kicker for you to watch back, sit back, watch those games, and see guys like Justin Tucker, Matt Prater, and all of kickers uh, succeed. Just look at this uh, last playoff weekend. Three of the yeah, four was, games were won on a walk-off kick. How cool yeah, is it as a kicker to see that? It was phenomenal. And the, the thing is, I every time I see a kicker try a, attempt a game-winning or game-tying kick, I am pulling for him to make that kick because I know what it feels like if you don't. <laughs> so he, so here, unless we played play them, you know, and that we compete against that that. That day, but last week, and I have to say this: that every time the kicker stepped on the field to win the game, I was pulling for him, regardless of what team is playing for, because I've been through that. I missed the famous kick one time, and it lingers with you. I made maybe 25, 30 game-winning kicks, but I missed a couple, and those are the ones you remember because you're supposed to make the ones that you made. Uh, so I am, uh, I'm, I'm always for a kicker to make. To make it, uh, to make it, because it's, when you win or lose a game, boy, if you don't make it, it stays with you forever. I'm sure those those three kickers are fairly happy uh, this and week. And also with the distance, you mentioned the distance. Yeah, the guys have gotten so god darn good. Now keep in mind is that there are some reasons that they have improved quite a bit. Uh, I remember you always snapped the ball seven yards. Now you kick eight yards. My rookie year, I think I had six kicks blocked because we didn't get enough height because we were one yard closer to the line of scrimmage than they are now. The fields are pretty darn good compared to some of the fields you see years ago when there was not much grass on the field. It was frozen. It was muddy. Also, we didn't have a snapper and a holder. The quarterback was typically the holder and he was in the game playing and the center was typically the, the snapper and he was busy playing and there were no warm-up nets on the sideline. So you just stood there for three hours and stayed as warm as you could. <laughs> and so that has helped, no question about it. And also you've had more practice because there were times during my early years, I'd say, Lenny, Lenny Dawson, he was my quarterback and the holder. We haven't kicked the kick all week long with the center and the holder. And they say, well, let's get hold of EJ Hollow. So we kick for maybe five minutes on Friday afternoon. That was, was often the whole week with the center and the holder. And also the footballs that we used in those days, they were the game balls. They were brand new balls that morning. They were hard. They were brand new. They hadn't been broken in like you see now. So the kicking ball uh, is more favorable. It, it comp compresses a little bit better. But still, my overall, so it goes a little further with the same impact. But overall, the kicking has become, it's, it's been made a lot of improvements since I started in the mid 60s. I went through 20 years of the evolution and did a lot of it. Uh, but and, I, and when I started to kick 50 yard field goals routine, routinely, that was a pretty big deal. It's gotten to the point that if you miss a 50 yard or not, it's a big deal. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we talked at the beginning, we showed you behind the scenes uh, in the archives. You know, that's where not a lot of people get to go and see. Not the everyday guest. Now, Mr. Senarud, if you came here to Canton to the Hall of Fame, we'd probably let you go back there and check some stuff out. But when everybody comes here to the Pro Football Hall of Fame to see, it's our Hall of Fame gallery where all those bronze busts are, are on display, signifying all the Hall of Famers we have inducted here into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So we want to give you guys a look into that as well. So Nathan Martin, the Youth and Education Coordinator, is out in our Hall of Fame gallery in front of a bus, Mr. Senarud, that probably looks fairly familiar to you. 
that, Jake. Thank you so much for sending it out here. And like he was saying, uh, Mr. Stenerud, students, I am in the Pro Football Hall of Fame gallery. Um, this is the place that when you visit Canton, this is where you have to spend some time at. Uh, 354 bronze busts. I'm surrounded by them. And right here, we've got Mr. Stenerud's bronze bust. Uh, first ever place kicker. Got his position listed there on his name plate. Um, Chiefs, Packers, and Vikings there, the years he played for those teams. But to kind of put it into perspective about how special and really how great elite you have to be to make it to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. In the history of the game, there have been over 300 million people that have played the game at all levels. You know, Little League, uh, Pop Warner, Middle School, High School, over 300 million. Only 5 million have been uh, lucky enough, good enough to play the game in college. And only about 30,000 have played the game or coached the game professionally. Of that 30,000, we've got 354 here in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And then, I mean, it's, it's even more elite when you think about the fact that Mr. Stinnerud is, is a place kicker. You know, there's him and, and Morn Anderson and maybe someday Adam Minitari or Justin Tucker, but there's not a lot of place kickers here uh, in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So it's very, very elite, special, um, and, and a great honor. For him to have but you know I've got a question I'm standing here and I was thinking you know being a foreign exchange student and and really the Pro Football Hall of Fame opened in 1963 uh, so when you started your professional career the Pro Football Hall of Fame probably wasn't a goal but maybe it was um, so what type of goals did you set um, in, in your career and your life and uh, how important do you think it is for students and really anybody watching to uh, set goals? Well, <clears throat> I don't know if I was good at setting specific goals, but I remember as far back uh, in Norway, the first grade, you're seven years, the year you turn seven years old. <clears throat> For some reason, I don't know how I ended up with that kind of thinking, but I wanted to be the best in the class. There were only 17 people in my class from first grade through seventh grade. And I don't know what, what it was. To me, school was almost like athletic competition. I played soccer and I skied, you know, since I was seven years old also. Competitively, we, had, we competed very young. And uh, uh, I, I, I approached schooling almost like an athletic event. I tried to be the best in the class. Now, as you go on to high school, a lot more people that, that are very good in certain things, uh, I didn't always attain that but I was always a good student because I worked hard at it and again I, I did I think I did the very best I could and that's uh, and I also surrounded myself with good friends I think I had friends that uh, share the same kind of attitude and the, and if somebody did something that I didn't think was right or uh, it wasn't the right thing to do I stayed away from from those kinds of people so I think it's very, very important to surround yourself the people that are good people and want to do the right thing. Yeah, I think you made two amazing points right there for our students and myself included. Make sure that you're surrounding yourself with great people and, you know, be the best you possibly can be. And you use the example of you when you were in school. I think our students can relate to that. You know, the challenge to them, make sure that they're doing the best that they possibly can do there in their classrooms. So uh, for me, for the bronze bust of Jan Stenerud, you know, that's all we have here from the Pro Football Hall of Fame Gallery. I'm going to send it back to Jake for a couple more questions. Awesome. Thanks, Nathan. And, Jan, just a few more to wrap up. Uh, you know, we talk about your career. You mentioned playing for Hall of Fame coach Hank Stram and teammate Len Dawson. But when you got to the NFL, got to the Chiefs, was there a, uh, a quote-unquote welcome to the NFL moment where you kind of stood back and go, man, I'm really in the big leagues now? Was it a, a game you played in? Maybe you were a teammate you had or – or now maybe a fellow Hall of Famer you either played with or against. What was that moment for you? Boy, I don't know. We played, uh, you know, by that time, every stadium was packed every game. And it was the big, it was the big league. And uh, it was just a matter of being able to keep your head on pretty straight and stick with the things that you believe was the right thing. Because you're young, uh, you got a lot of different personalities on the football team. And I just tried to do the right thing as much as I could but also, it, it was enormous. So coming from a small school in Norway, of course, the Montana State, now we have stadiums that are packed, televised. And it, it was sometimes tempting to maybe go out to party too much at times. 
I have always done thing in moderation. At least I think I have. Uh, and that comes from your, I think it comes from your, your, your parents, your, your teachers. Teaching, by the way, where I came from in Norway, teaching was very high paying, very respected job. It was like being a doctor or a dentist where I grew up. And that's how the, the teachers were viewed. Uh, so I, I think I learned that from my teacher, teachers and my parents. I always tried to do, I think I had learned pretty good values and I tried to do it the right way and try to stay away from some of the, the, temptions, the temptations that could got, get you off stride a little bit. I, and that's cool. And it's cool to talk about that because you think of pro football players, you know, they're, they're, they're heroes, they're role models, but you know, some of the struggles you went through and things you just talked about, some of our students have to go through every day. So it's cool to see how, you know, no matter who you are, there's things you have to get through in your life, you know, to help yourself become the best that you can be. And I got to just two more questions. And this, this next one, pretty simple question, game practice by yourself in a field, longest field goal you've ever kicked. Longest field I ever kicked was 59 yards. And that was actually in college in, in 1965. That was in my last game, my first season, which was my uh, senior season. And it took us, in those days, it took us about five days to learn that that 59-yard field goal broke the college record by five yards and the pro record by three yards. And that's why about a week or two later, that was the last game of the season, that I got a telegram that said, congratulations, you've been drafted in the third round of the AFL redshirt draft. Addressed to Jan Stenner at Cairo, Montana State University Athletic Department. So draft day was a little bit different in those days than this today. I was going to say, yeah, you know, you look, there's, there's people invited to draft day. There's cameras in their rooms. You got a telegram saying, hey, guess what? You get to go play in the, in the, then in the AFL. Very cool. All right. Um, last question for you, Mr. Senarud. And I first want to, for myself and everybody here at the Hall of Fame, thank you so much for giving some of your time today, getting up early there on the West Coast and being a part of this program today. Thank you for everything you've done for the game of football, changing the, the game and everything you do for us here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. But, but Jake, uh, but let my, me interject quickly. That yep, go ahead. My also, getting a glimpse of some of the uh, young people that ask me questions. Uh, this has been a fun experience for me. It really has been. It's given me more than I've given back. It, it, was, a, it was just a neat morning for me. I, I always remember this. Awesome. Well, I, I know I appreciate that. I know Nathan and our, our staff here as well appreciate that. And I know and I hope the students appreciate that um, just as much. So my last question is, you know, we had a lot of really good nuggets of information today. A lot of things that people can walk away using their everyday life, apply to their lives at home, the classroom, their sport that they play. But if there's one thing you want everybody to take away from today, what is that one piece of information you want them to remember? Well, I think to reiterate some of the words that you say earlier in the telecast, commitment, in integrity, honesty, and that type of a thing. Uh, do things the right way. We all know what the right thing is to do. There are a lot of temptations to do things that aren't right. Stick with your values and always try to do the right thing. And don't be bullied into doing something that you don't feel like doing. What a great way to wrap up this installment of the Pro Football Hall of Fame's Heart of a Hall of Famer series, Connected by Extreme Networks with class of 1991 in Shriney. You saw his bronze bust right there, Mr. Jan Stenerud. Everybody, uh, let's give Mr. Stenerud uh, a big round of applause here again, Mr. Stenerud. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of the program today. Uh, and like I said, you know, the game of football wouldn't be what it is today without our Hall of Famers influence. And truly anybody who played the game, uh, it wouldn't look like it is today. The, the kicking game wouldn't be what it is without your influence. So thank you for everything you've done for the game of football. And thank you for everything you do for us here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. To all of our viewers out there, both uh, all of our interactive schools, all of our view-only schools, and anybody who happened to catch this on, on Facebook, whether now or six months from now, thank you so much for tuning in. We appreciate you, and uh, we thank you so much for being a part of the program. So for myself, for Mr. Santa Root, uh, Nathan Martin, uh, Jerry Shockey, all the way up to our president here at the Hall of Fame, Mr. Jim Porter, thank you so much for tuning in today. We hope to see you for another great, Heart of a Hall of Famer program connected by Extreme Networks. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you later.